joining us now to talk about the uh, crash of the Boeing 777, the Asiana Airlines, um, that crashed at uh, San Francisco International Airport on Saturday, is Dan Daniel Rose, a military-trained pilot, aviation attorney. Hey, Daniel, how are you, sir? Good. Thanks for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, okay. Talk about this kind of crash. I mean, how rare is something like this? Well, uh, you mentioned my background in the Navy, and uh, I, I can't help but go back to the days of landing on the carrier, and uh, you would watch every approach come in, and, uh, you know, there were a lot more frequent instances of what's called ram strikes when part of the plane hits, hits the ramp. Of course, there, you had to clear the ramp by 11 feet uh, to be on glide slope. Here, uh, he was very low and slow. You had to clear the, the end of the runway by about 150 feet, and he, of course, didn't, didn't come close to that. Um, so, but the answer is, in, civili in civilian aviation, commercial aviation, um, uh, very rare. Uh, certainly in this country, we've had a, uh, we've had a great uh, track record in the last few decades. Um, you know, landings remain probably the, the most uh, dangerous phase of flight statistically, but overall, it's still very safe. Uh, once you leave uh, the country and you get, you know, towards some of the third world countries and, and, uh, and, and Eastern Asia, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit different. They, they haven't, uh, you know, to, to the extent that we have here, they haven't really developed an aviation safety system. And um, it's, it's more, uh, unfortunately, likely that you could have circumstances like we saw at uh, All right, now, now, I'm sorry. Now, let, let's talk about the circumstances that we saw and what you might be referring to. Uh, first of all, a lot of attention now focused on the pilot, uh, that he only had 40-some-odd hours of flying uh, a 777 prior to this flight. Um, I guess, you know, at first glance to a, an amateur like me, that might seem like, wow, that's outrageous. But... There's always going to be a pilot that's flying his first flight, you know, after training, correct? Yeah, you know, it's like a doctor, you know. At some point, they got to have their first patient, right? So you, you, you don't want to know about that as a passenger, and if you are a passenger, you might opt out. But so how, so how much of this, because, and, and I want you to tell us, you know, what you think the problem was. We hear about the, the voice recorders reportedly, you know, they, they tried to avert a landing and, and, and take off again and to try it again. But so how much of the, these circumstances that we now know about uh, do you believe could be attributable to the fact that this was his first uh, full flight on this, air, this, uh, this airplane? Well, I, I think what I've heard is it's his first full flight into San Francisco uh, with 43 hours. I'm sure he's, he's, he's uh, you know, even if you count 10 hours for the flight over, he's, he's at least flown the, the Okay, the so his first, day, right, his first, day, his first uh, flight of that length probably to San Francisco. Okay. Right. right. And, you know, that in and of itself um, should really not be troubling. Um, you know, he had uh, thousands of hours, I think 12,000 hours um, in other aircraft. Um, but I, I think that opens up the door to a couple of issues. Uh, one is, um, you know, the dynamic that's in the cockpit. And, you know, I, I, we all know what happened here. It was low and slow and, and, and it crashed into the, the seawall. The question is why. And um, I, I think you're going to have to look at the human factors specifically to get a, a good handle on that. And, and where the experience comes in, I think, uh, and this is, you know, a little bit of speculation, but you know, you do have two senior, uh, in, in terms of flight hours, uh, people in the cockpit. One is learning, one is supposed to be training to some extent. Um, and you may have a dynamic that is not traditional and, and kind of uncomfortable where the so-called senior um, pilot may be a little bit more reluctant to uh, speak up or, or, or warn or caution uh, what he considers to be, you know, a contemporary, at least in, in flight experience and perhaps age and, and, you know, maybe even higher up in seniority at the company. So yeah, the, the co-pilot, the co I believe, had uh, over 3,200 hours of flying experience with the Boeing 777. Right, right. So that, 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 uh, does, so make, that does make your point, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I, I guess my overall point is, you know, these are some of the things you're going to have to look at to get an answer to why was this plane low and slow, uh, you know. Other issues are, are certainly, I think, to look at are, are the automation involved. Um, again, this comes back to was this pilot used to flying a different plane, the Airbus? The Airbus has a very different uh, philosophy in terms of automation, and it's much more automated. You can just sit there and pull back on the uh, 
the stick, the yoke, and the plane will go exactly where you want it to go and, and give you the, enough power. Boeing has a different philosophy. They have a philosophy of, well, we're going to give you automation and computerization, but at the end of the day, we're going to default to the pilot to fly the plane. And as a result, some of their systems are different, um, such as a system called automatic throttles, auto throttles, which is supposed to set the amount of power uh, you need for the approach. And if you get too slow, add a lot of power. Uh, that system, however, under the Boeing design is disabled under 400 feet because it thinks you're getting ready to land. So it becomes a pilot's responsibility and there's no automation to kick in and indications are that they were going too slow, correct? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I think there you, you got to look at the, the potential mismatch between uh, the pilot and the automation. What did the pilot expect the automation to do? What did the automation think the pilot wanted it to do? Daniel, we're talking to Daniel Rose, military trained pilot, aviation attorney here on the Steve Malzberg Show. Uh, as an aviation attorney, um, what could we expect legally coming out of this? I mean, the, the, the injuries, the paralysis in at least two people, uh, hospitalization of hundreds. Um, we also have... Um, an instance where it appears uh, that uh, 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 one of the two girls who died was tragically run over possibly by an emergency vehicle responding to the scene. So what, what can we expect legally going forward here? It's, uh, you know, uh, obviously the, the first concern is for hopefully everybody to get better as soon as possible uh, and, and to, to best wishes for the families that uh, lost loved ones. But, you know, there, there's going to be... Uh, inevitably a legal process that develops. It's, it's pretty complicated uh, by virtue of the fact that it's an international flight. There's an international treaty that generally covers the liability of airlines uh, who fly internationally. I, I could bore you with hours of, of what, that, what that means, but it's very complicated. Um, you know, but, but from, a, from a legal point of view, the system, the legal system should really track the NTSB's findings uh, to some extent. So the NTSB will look at uh, you know, what caused it, I, I, and I don't think they're going to just leave it at pilot error. I think they'll look deeper into some of the other issues, such as the instrument landing system, the automation, the training, and, um, you know, the, the legal system, uh, the legal process should really track that so that, uh, you know, for instance, if, if the, the drivers that were responding, uh, albeit, you know, certainly with good nature, I'm sure, uh, were careless in the way they did it, and it turns out that they, they injured somebody, you know, that's another legal issue that, that pops up. Let, uh, me, let me ask you one, 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 one final question, Daniel. Um, do, do you think there should be a system? I mean, I, like I alluded to earlier, I probably wouldn't get on a plane if I knew it was this, this guy's first intercontinental uh, uh, trip. Uh, but, you know, you, you do get to ask a doctor how many of these surgeries have you performed? Uh, you're new in the practice. How many years have you been practicing? You think there should be some way that people could uh, find this stuff out about pilots? Well, uh, do I think uh, it should be? Uh, ideally, yeah. Um, but uh, as a practical matter, that, that's never going to happen. And, you know, as a practical matter, I think you have to fall back on the overall safety of our, of our aviation system and take... Uh, sorry about that. That's uh, all right. Solace in knowing that that's, um, you know, that the odds are with you, if you will, and that there are, there are systems in place and uh, cross checks and precautions in place to make sure that uh, even if you have, you know, a, a younger pilot or less experienced, that they're paired up with more senior um, pilots, that there's a process and training phase uh, in, in place that is structured and standardized so that, you know, you can get people through the, the pipeline safely and obviously uh, and not jeopardize whatsoever uh, the traveling public. Right. That's the one priority. Daniel, thank you so much, sir. I hope you get to talk.